Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Matt. Nice to see you all. Um, as Lisa alluded to, this is for Lisa Ashton and Tyler Crandall. This is their uh, one year they've been at Commonway. And I don't know if it's felt like really long or really short. I don't want to ask them, but um, the two of them just hit the ground running and haven't stopped. And we want to express our, our appreciation to them this morning for, for their ministry, for, for all they add to our church and our staff. And you noticed in the lobby, um, there's some snacks and food and stuff. And so I just want to encourage you afterward uh, to stick around. They'll be out in the lobby between services and just to say thanks. And we want them to know how much we appreciate who they are and what they add um, to our church. So I got to tell you guys, I was deeply moved by your response to what I share, <clears throat> shared. I'm not crying. I'm something in my throat. <clears throat> <laughs> to what I shared last Sunday, your texts, your emails, the conversations out in the lobby. Just thank you. Um, if you missed last Sunday, I just would encourage you to go online and maybe listen to that. <clears throat> I shared a little bit about my divorce and just... Um, walking through some difficult stuff. And it's not that I'm not going to talk about that again. I will. I just am probably not going to talk about that like I did last Sunday again anytime soon. Um, but again, that whole experience of just kind of putting myself out there and then your response of, of love and grace and uh, support, um, it honestly felt to me like, like a life, like a defining moment. I had to take a nap afterwards, but still, uh, it just impacted me in a really, really profound way. So thank you. As I've been reflecting on last Sunday and what we shared together, um, and I say this in all humility, uh, perhaps it was a significant moment as well for, for all of us, for our church. Um, like maybe it's a moment that, that God wants to actually build on. I had a number of people say, I felt like I was at church. Yeah, yeah, same. So I'm not sure what God has for us in, in that, this next season, but I have a sense that perhaps he wants to deepen our experience of uh, being a part of a church. Um, I think one of the ways he does this is when we take a little risk to be more real with each other and to, to walk through hard things in a way that's honest and also hopeful, so... With that, if you have a Bible, uh, please turn with me to Acts chapter 2. W would you actually turn there? Uh, if you have a Bible or on your phone, I actually um, I need your help with something in just a minute. We heard this passage a few weeks ago from, from Herb Bawalda, um, and as he explained and, and kind of so well, that the church is meant to be a place where we, are, we gather around Jesus in community, and we scatter. We, we're sent out on this mission that Jesus has given us. And so this chapter 2, it's a very well-known passage that describes the beginning of the church uh, in Jerusalem, picking up in verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Question for you. How would you characterize this church that's described in Acts chapter 2? Like how, what words, what phrases would you use to describe it? And I'm not even being rhetorical. I'm asking <laughs> ideal, selfless, selfless yeah. Relational. Relational, I think I heard vibrant. Yeah, would you say there's a, a high level or low level of community? Pretty high. They met together every day. Do these people not have kids in sports or activities? <laughs> I mean, gathering one time a week, that's like hard for a lot of us. Uh, every day they met. What else? Devoted. There's a very high sense of ownership, 
of shared mission, of investment. They're selling their property, their possessions to give to the mission of the church. That part, we, as Americans, we don't like that, right? Am I have to give my stuff? Uh, yeah. What else? Anything? Single-minded. Single -minded. Yeah. Physical needs satisfied. Strong sense of fellowship. They ate together in one another's homes. So, thank you. So overall, there's a, like this buzz, this sense of excitement, movement. We are a part of something amazing God is doing. It's bigger than us, and we get to participate. Boy, you'd think something like that would be really compelling to people, right? That people who weren't a part of the church would see this and would be lined up out the door, I want in on that, which of course is exactly what happened. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So I read all this and I think, that, that's, it sounds amazing. That I want to be a part of a church like that. See, this passage um, is often held up as like the ideal picture of what the church should be like today. And that's, it's good, it's inspiring, it's challenging. But for everyone who says, we should get back to being the New Testament church. Oftentimes, we have in mind this sort of romanticized view. What we don't stop to think about is the fact that the church, described in Acts chapter 2, is in like the honeymoon phase. Everything's new. Everything's great. Um, it's, it's brand new. Every day was an exciting event. It's basically summer camp. Think of all the church problems they haven't been around long enough yet to discover. No silly arguments about the color of carpet. No, uh, no one's complaining, it's not my worship style, or I didn't get anything out of the sermon, or I'm just not being fed here. No one's upset over the quality of the coffee, or that their uh, community outreach idea didn't get implemented. They haven't had to like lovingly confront the person in small group who talks too much. I can assure you, none of that ever happens here. This is just stuff I've heard about just other places. But here's the thing. You keep reading in Acts, this isn't the end of the story. I mean, a few chapters later, Acts chapter 5, again, they're sell liquidating their assets to give to the mission. And there's this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who misrepresent their generosity because they wanted to appear better than they were. And Acts chapter 5 says, they drop dead on the spot for lying to God and the community. And we're like, I don't know if I want to be a New Testament. I don't know if I really want to be a New Testament church anymore. Uh, the church at this point is made up only of, of Jews. The gospel had not yet gone to the Gentiles. And so at this moment, it's a fairly homogenous group, similar ethnicity, background, traditions, beliefs. Now, when the church later in Acts expands to the Gentiles, like the whole world, well, what do you think happens when a whole bunch of people get together with wildly different backgrounds, perspectives, personalities, expectations, ideals, hopes, fears, baggage? Yeah, it's about to get really messy. You keep reading and you find that the same church in Jerusalem goes on to deal with racism in the church, tension between the haves and the have-nots, power dynamics, leadership splits, false teaching, debates over theology, disagreements over secondary issues, you name it. I mean, Acts is really beautiful, but it's anything but utopian. In fact, most of the New Testament epistles or letters, um, like the rest of the passages basically that we have about the, the, the church in the New Testament, they're actually written to address problems, internal and external. I think it's kind of weird to think about the fact that we wouldn't have like a third of the New Testament if, it, if there wasn't so much dysfunction that had to be addressed. So with that in mind, turn to Romans 12 this is what I want to focus on. Uh, Romans 12 was written in roughly the year 57, which means this is 20 years or so after the rosy beginning of the church described in Acts chapter 2. The church in Rome at this point had experienced, of course, their share of highs, of, like the good moments of, of being church. At the same time, though, they've gone through some stuff. Um, they've seen the messy 
the ugly side of church. Hang around church long enough, and you'll experience that too. You will discover, usually through pain, that what you bring to a church community, your background, personality, expectations, ideals, fears, hopes, baggage, wounds, that those things inevitably spill out onto the, like these bleed out onto the people around you, and vice versa. We discover people hurt us. We hurt others. We're, we're disappointed. Uh, we feel underappreciated, like, I'm serving. Why can't other people step up and do their part? We try our best to get connected, and it doesn't seem to work out. We can't find our people. We have disagreements. It's so easy to get disillusioned or cynical about the church. And so we all know this, but there is a gap between what we hope the church is, between the dream, the ideal, and then reality at times, what we experience. And so I think Paul, in many ways, is writing to the Romans, to us, to say, what do we do with this gap? And you'll see in this, Paul is not naive. He's lived way too much to be naive. He's also not cynical. He's incredibly honest. He's going to call things what they are, but he does so in such a hopeful, gracious, expecting the best kind of way. He doesn't scold or lecture or talk down. Instead, he lovingly calls them and us up to live out our calling to be the church. I just want us to listen to this vision for what our life together is supposed to look like. As we walk through this, I really want us to hear this as if Paul were also addressing us today, like Commonway Church. Um, I want to mention Romans, if you don't know, it's like, it's like a theological masterpiece. Uh, the first eight chapters are all about what God has done for us, and not just us, but for the entire creation. So what God has done for us in Christ's coming, life, death, burial, resurrection, his ascension, and the coming of the Spirit of Jesus. Chapters 9 through 11 are all about what Christ has done in the church, that he has launched a new multi-ethnic Jew plus Gentile family. I mean, these are two groups in the first century that were at each other's throat, the pain, war, oppression, it had gotten really ugly. But these two groups have now come together in Christ to live as a new, new kind of family. Then, chapter 12, you get this hinge chapter. Paul's opening line is, therefore. Therefore, in light of the 11 chapters that have come before this, uh, what God has done in Jesus, what Christ has done in the church, now, therefore, verse 1, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, view of his grace. That's like his summary of the 11 chapters that have, that have come before this. In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, your whole self, not just your beliefs, not just your doctrine, but your bodies, your soul, all that you are to God as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't be like the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Notice Paul's first metaphor for the church is family. Uh, the word, the Greek word is adelphoi. It's translated brothers and sisters. We're a family. Paul's actually drawing from something Jesus says in Mark chapter 4. He says, my family... My brothers and sisters are those who do the will of God. We're a family, not built around ethnicity or tribalism or ideologies, but around doing the will of God together. Verse 3, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, no exceptions to this rule, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Which means humility is a prerequisite, hard word to say, prerequisite for this community we're going to read about. Verse 4, for just as each of us has one body 
with many members, many parts. I have an arm, I have a leg, I have uh, an ear. I mean, these different parts. These members do not all have the same function. My fingers do one thing, my head does another. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body. Each member belongs to all the others. So here's Paul's second metaphor. Here it's not a family, it's something even more intimate, a body. We're a body. Each of us have a part to play. We don't belong to ourselves. None of us are on our own. If you follow his line of thinking, like my arm not connected to my body is like dead. I can reach my hand out to, to shake your hand, and that we get that. That means one thing. If I reach my hand out and it's disconnected from my body and I say, that's disturbing, right? That's a problem. And in the same way, none of us are on our own. We're a body. We have a part to play. And that's what he's getting to. Verse 6, we each have different gifts. God has hardwired us with unique capacities, not just for us, but for others. We are to serve one another in the body. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And you get the sense, this is not an exhaustive list. Next, Paul gives us 25 short, like rapid fire commands. And I, I think what he's doing is, how do we move from this metaphor, this idea of a body, and how does that translate into how we live day to day? Verse 9, love must be sincere. Love must come from the heart. We're not pretending. This isn't a show. He says, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Notice, not just devoted to God, but devoted also to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. To honor someone is to, is to recognize their special, their unique contribution to the church, to your life, to appreciate them, to thank them, and give them their due. Can you imagine if like a whole group of people did this? I'm going to honor you instead of trying to honor myself. I'm going to say to you, you've done this for me. Thank you. Um, I wouldn't be who I am today without you. Thank you. Honor one another above yourselves. Verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. It says, stir up that inner flame of zeal or passion. Like, let's come together and throw more fuel on this fire. Spur one another on to follow Jesus. Verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. We're to suffer together with resilience. Based on our shared hope, our shared conviction, as Lisa mentioned this morning, that Jesus will return and make all things new. There's a joy that the Spirit gives us that cannot be explained. We're to pray together, persevere together, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Those of us with a lot, we're, we're supposed to share with those who have little, to become a community of justice and generosity. Practice hospitality. Open up your home. To those here who would say, I, I don't know how to cook. Okay, that's what YouTube is for, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you, if I could learn to do it, you could learn too as well. Anyone can learn. Let your home become a place of healing and reconciliation. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. When your family is happy, you should feel that happiness. When your family's sad, feel that sadness. Get involved in people's pain, even when it's inconvenient or not fun or you have your own stuff to deal with. These are opportunities for us to move toward one another. I like that he says this rejoicing part. People should never have to feel like they need to downplay their successes or their joys around you. I heard somebody say once that if you put a bunch of crabs in a bucket and one of them tries to get out, meaning something good's happening to it, the other crabs will reach up and pull it back down in. Yeah. 
So don't be crabs, I guess. <laughs> That's the point of that. <laughs> Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, which is the root cause of almost all relational tension and conflict. Do not be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Again, do not be conceited. I mean, Paul begins and ends this whole thing around humility. It's the one command that gets repeated in this whole list because, again, without humility, there is no chance for community. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Don't get back at people. Don't hurt when you are hurt. I heard someone say that we are to become a graveyard for hate. I like that. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, because reconciliation is a two-way street, but on your side, live at peace with everyone. Be quick to repent, quick to apologize, to have hard conversations. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Trust God to take care of you, to have your back. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And then he ends with this summary verse. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What a beautiful and compelling vision. I love Romans 12 because, first of all, it's, it's really honest. Like, Paul assumes that there's going to be tension and interpersonal conflict and people who want to get even and people who we don't always want to share or do our part. He just assumes that that is in us, and it is. And then he lovingly calls the church out of sin to live up to this dream of a family, of a body. I just want us to imagine if Paul were giving all these commands, again, to us, to common way. Like, what if we were to do some honest assessment, a little self-reflection, where are, and all these things, where are we strong? Where are we a little weaker and have some room to grow? So this is what we're going to be talking about the next four weeks. Um, but just a, a little preview here. I think if Paul were here, I think he would say to some of us, he would challenge us to step up in the area of serving this body of using the unique gifts and capacities God has given you. I mean, at the core of who Jesus was, this is how he lived his life. He came to serve. That's who we follow. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. He's our model. I was thinking this week, um, you know when Paul starts out and he says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, and we're like, okay, so Las Vegas type stuff. Okay, but also... Do not be conformed to the way the world works in terms of everything's about me and a consumer individualistic mentality. He said, that's, that's the way the world works. That's what you find everywhere else, but not here, not in this family, not in this body. Everyone contributes. Everyone plays a part. We're called to be different. I think he would challenge some of us to, that he would say, you need to renew your commitment to community. To relationships in this season. The world, we all know this, takes away our, our fervor, our passion. It just drains it out of us. Um, this is part of why we gather. Paul would have never imagined this happening just on our own. Like he's like, of course, this is part of why we gather. I mean, the church in Acts 2, they, got, they met every day, right? You couldn't stop them from, from gathering. But just imagine a few decades later, the writer of Hebrews has to say something like this. Think about how far they've, they've come. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. Do you know why he had to say that? Yeah, you get it. As some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching, meaning we all need to be reminded of this. I like that he uses the word habit. We've been talking all year. We shape our habits, and then our habits shape us. Just get out of the habit. And post-COVID or wherever we are with that, 
I mean, we're now in a place where we don't have to do anything we don't absolutely, like, are passionate about doing right now in this moment. We kind of got, just got out of it, right? So community starts with showing up. Remember that line in Romans 12 um, where he says, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn? We can't do that if we're not involved, if we don't know what's going on in one another's lives. I think it's tragic when anybody, but especially someone who's a part of a church, goes through difficulty, and they don't, they don't have anyone. It's just them. Um, one of the things this whole season for me has reminded me just in, in my conversations is that, by the way, everyone is fighting a great battle, to use that quote. We're all dealing with stuff. We all need people to mourn with us, to walk with us, as Galatians says, to carry one another's burdens. And so it starts with showing up. Let me tell you something you already know. You can get great content on the internet, great preachers, like world-class, you know, sermons. Uh, You can listen to worship songs and feel encouraged. I mean, shoot, I can go to the gym, feel a little better, do yoga. Not going to do that, but I could. Uh, walk the dog or have the coffee, whatever, you know, all that stuff. It doesn't get, those are good things. It doesn't get to what he's describing here. These writers are saying that there is a life. There is a vitality that comes from meeting together, face-to-face interactions. You know, you often hear, maybe this is you, people who say, I just don't feel very connected to God in this season. And I always want to say, are you connected to, the, to his body? That would be like the, maybe the first place that we should look. So he says, don't, whatever you do, don't give this up. Make this a priority. You actually have agency in the amount of spiritual zeal or passion you currently right now are experiencing. It starts with showing up. Be devoted to one another. Um, I think one of the ways that we can do this, and this is just, again, assessment about where we are, we've had a number of new families join Commonway over the past year, and one of my concerns is that those of us who've been here a long time, we know everybody and stuff, we just kind of come in, we do our thing, we leave, and we forgot what it was like to not know anybody, forgot what it was like to just kind of be watching and and wanting to connect, and so I think there's a, a challenge here for all of us to be a little more intentional with our time. You know, you can show up, and you're here, you're present, but then you can show up like all of you. I want to encourage you to take five or ten minutes before or after service and get to know people. You never know what God might want to do in your life through them or in their life through you. Invite a few people over to lunch, to your home for dinner. This is about commitment and investment over the long haul, it's very easy to love the dream of community. I love the idea of community. Uh, but that's a hypothetical. That's not a real thing. It's easy to love the idea of, of marriage or church or friendship or you name it because it's not real. The ideal requires very little of us. It is a lot harder to love Ed across the table who won't stop talking about himself. It's a lot harder to commit precious time and energy into investing, being devoted to these relationships here. No church, I'm going to say this up front, no community, no pastor can live up to your expectations. Everyone and everything will eventually let you down. By the way, including yourself, because we're human. And so we need to make lots of room for humility and grace and forgiveness along the way. Henry Nouwen once said, you know what we need to do? We need to forgive each other for not being God. That sounds like a good place to start. Rollheiser, uh, another contemplative writer, he says, churches are compromised, dirty, and sinful. But just like our blood families, they're also real. In the presence of people who share life with us regularly, we cannot lie, especially to ourselves, and delude ourselves into thinking we are generous and noble or whatever. In community, the truth emerges and fantasies are dispelled. Not being involved with church because of the church's faults 
is often the great rationalization. What is too painful to deal with is not the church's imperfection, but my own fantasies about my own goodness, which in the grind of real community will become painfully obvious. Nobody deflates us more than does our own family. The same is true of the church. Not all of this is bad. My counselor reminds me often, and I've heard this phrase other places, but he says, if our greatest pain comes through relationships, it makes sense that our greatest healing would also come through relationships. I think Paul would challenge us, this, this third area, to grow in our generosity. In the New Testament, the, these churches are marked by radical, radical generosity. So we're going to talk about that in a few weeks. I'm not going to tell you to sell your assets or liquefy, what is, liquidate your 401k. But we are going to call each other to be more intentional with our generosity. I got to warn you guys, um, these practices are very counterintuitive. They don't even make sense uh, on the front end, like most of the things Jesus teaches us. But here's what I know about me. Left, left to my own devices, I'm selfish, I'm stingy, I don't really want to be around people, I don't want to need people, and, and all that's like after I've had my coffee and I'm fully awake, okay? <laughs> I need help. I need another way. It's in following Jesus, this life of the kingdom that he invites us into in all these ways that are counterintuitive. It, the kingdom is upside down. It doesn't actually make sense. But you take him up on it, you trust him, and you find that in doing so, your life actually gets bigger. Your sense of purpose, it actually, I don't know how it works, I just think he, he knows what he's talking about. Your, your sense of purpose grows and expands. We don't do these things out of obligation. We do them because we're created for connection, for belonging. We do them because we are made in the image of a self-giving, generous God, because that's where joy is found. And so, again, over the next few weeks, I'm going to be inviting you, challenging you as your pastor to be more intentional in the areas of serving, connection and community and generosity. It's just the beginning. <laughs> These are foundational practices that form us and make us more like Jesus. To get a little more specific, uh, after this, this series, so the next four weeks, uh, the next stop on our year of spiritual formation, starting in September, we're going to be doing another church-wide sort of experience. And we're really excited about it. We're calling it Deeper. We'll have a better graphic than this in the future. <laughs> <laughs> deeper, meaning with God, with self, and with others. And this is going to take us all the way to Advent. And I'm telling you, I, th I think we've saved the best stuff for last year. So for 10 weeks, we are going to be doing some work together around the area of emotional health. <clears throat> I'm not an expert on this. Uh, I, did, I didn't even know my hair was curly until like a year and a half ago. So like there's things I don't know, you know what I mean? Um, I've done, I don't know why I told you that. Uh, <laughs> I've done a lot of work, I mean, actually a lot of work in this area over the past several years. I'm just saying I'm on this journey uh, very much. So we'll be drawing a lot from the work of Pete Scazzaro, Christian writer, thinker, as several books, Emotionally Healthy Church, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, some other folks. And of course, all of this will be grounded in Scripture. But the idea is that we all have a lot going on beneath the surface of our lives, stuff we may not even be aware of. And in the midst of our, our routines and our busyness and our responsibilities, it's, it's very difficult unless you are intentional to actually get to that stuff. So we are going to be talking about things like being more aware of our emotions what's driving us, healthy ways of handling them. This is a lot easier to see in other people than ourselves. You ever out at a restaurant and you see someone just go off on like the server and they are, they're mad, they're upset, they're throwing a Mississippi hissy fit. And you know it can't just be because of the nachos. 
I don't think they know it, but something is going on beneath the surface in their emotions, something at home or work, and it's just spilling out on everybody around them. We're going to talk about dealing with our past. In what ways am I operating out of old wounds and baggage? And I'm just showing up to every interaction and relationship, and it's just, it's just all these things come out. Why do I have trouble shutting off my work? Just go and go and go. Could it be, I mean, I say I'm, I'm not lazy, right? I just want to be a hard worker, productive. Could it also be because in my family of origin, I was raised to, like, what got affirmed was the stuff I did. Like, where I sensed value and worth was because of what I accomplished. I'm just giving you a hypothetical, okay? Or for someone else, you know, why do I seem to go through relationship after relationship, and it always ends the same? It's always the same pattern. You know the saying, wherever you go, there you are? Often it's things we're not aware of that are driving us. Uh, we're going to talk about receiving the gift of limits. That'll be a new idea for some of us. How do we honestly uh, embrace grief and loss and disappointment? How do we love others well, especially in areas where we're dealing with conflict or we're feeling defensive or where we need to practice forgiveness? This is where real life is. Um, this is going to ask something of each of us. This is kind of hard work. It's kind of slow. And I know you're, you're maybe, I know everyone's going, that sounds super fun. <laughs> sounds super fun. Let me tell you, again, this stuff is not my natural lane. Um, do you know what's actually fun? Discovering, through the help of the Spirit and Scripture and this work, discovering that there's an area of your life where you just are, you're banging your head into the wall, and all of a sudden having this moment where you go, oh, there's actually, like, I actually have choice. I actually have agency. There's, the whole point of this is that we would grow in wholeness and freedom, and that's what Jesus wants for us. All of this, by the way, does come from Scripture. Um, Granted, Paul and the writers of the New Testament, they didn't have our um, modern language around self-awareness or, or psychology. But this is essentially Romans 12. This is actually what we just walked through. Um, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. <laughs> Emotional health requires self-awareness, requires humility. I would argue that only when a person is secure in their identity as a son or daughter of, of God in the safety of community, only when that's settled can you take a, a, a hard look at yourself and not be threatened by what you, what you discover. I actually have a sense of humor. Yeah, I do that. I'm inconsistent there. That's, you know, one of my blind spots or whatever. I can't rejoice with those who rejoice. If out of my own insecurity and issues I haven't dealt with, uh, your success threatens me. Even more so with the difficult emotions. If, if your grief or what you're going through kind of triggers unresolved, i got to avoid that at all costs instead of entering in. It is difficult to live at peace with someone that you're trying to control. Why can't I get you to do what I want? Or if I have a hard time living in community with people who disagree with me because I don't know where I end and you begin. How can we begin to love our enemies, as Paul says, if we can't love each other? I would argue we are only able to offer our gifts to the world when we're secure in our identity, who God made us uniquely. We're not, it's, that's settled. We're not comparing ourselves to someone else or their gift. This is the goal of all this, that you would offer yourself, body, mind, heart, soul, emotions, relationships, all that you are to God. And a lot of us have never been taught to do this stuff. And so we're moving into a season where we're asking God to help us go deeper. 
So that's what we'll be covering on Sundays starting in September. And in addition to the work we're doing on, on Sunday, um, Lisa and some others have been working hard to finalize a deeper, like a participant's guide. Basically, this book, uh, Reflection Guide, we're going to have printed up here in the coming weeks. And we will give one of these guides to anyone who wants to join us in this journey. But the idea is that you would give some time each week to the content, some reflection questions, some light homework, some journaling, uh, that you would do that in the week that corresponds with that Sunday. And then we're asking you to get with someone else during the week, ideally one of the small groups that we're forming, to discuss, to share what you're learning together because of everything that I've said today. So again, it's a 10-week commitment. We don't want anyone, anyone, anyone to, to miss out. I know we mentioned back in April at the end of Rooted that we may be doing Rooted. That It's a totally different experience, but again, right now uh, in the fall. And that being said, we have decided instead that we're going to put all of our energy into Deeper. It's that important. Rooted and Deeper are two totally independent, unrelated. Not everything's related, but you know what I mean. You, uh, if you didn't do Rooted, and if you don't even know what I'm talking about, you're fine, okay? You didn't miss anything in terms of jumping in on this. So we'd love for you to consider joining a 10-week group for Deeper. Last couple thoughts, and I'm done. This is not going to be just another series. This is not going to be just another small group experience. We're actually praying for, like, breakthrough in our lives, that we would just have aha moments for each of us, and that as individuals, um, as a church, we take some real tangible steps toward becoming more like this community in, in Romans 12. So sign up for groups begin in two weeks. Lisa's going to share more about that next week. The reason I'm telling you this now is because it's like this is what we're doing. <laughs> and we have kind of a short runway, and we want everyone to be on board because uh, we're going for it. Jesus wants to save us. We know that. He also wants to bring us wholeness. Um, Ephesians 4.13 says, Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You know, um, that word save, it actually also means to heal. Um, that the invitation to follow Jesus, at the same time, he never imagined us on our own doing this. It's a call to join his family. This group of broken people, that, at least I am, um, messy people, and we hurt each other, and we, people do weird stuff, that we would experience deeper maturity and fullness together in him. Would you stand with me? And we'll pray. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for what you're doing in our church. Just this sense over the year of how you've been guiding us and leading us and challenging us in so many ways. Lord, I thank you for the, for the areas in each one of our lives. Hopefully, we're all experiencing hope in you. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage to keep going in this next season. Um, God, I'm a little bit scared about it. I don't know fully what it's going to look like. I know it's going to be challenging. But I know you're with us. And that fullness and wholeness that you're calling us to, that it's, it's worth it. And may we experience more of that. Lord, help us to grow uh, in the coming weeks as a community, as a family, to grow in our sense of belonging and investment partnership, that you would make us more like the body that you had in mind. Um, Lord, uh, we just give you praise. We honor you in all of this. It's in Jesus' name uh, we pray. Amen. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Have a great week, um, and we'll see you next time.